In this week's episode of The Fallout, it's been a long time coming, but there are a couple of number 10s in this league this weekend who are absolutely tearing up. If you like lovely movement, this is the video for you. We'll also let you know why Johan Cruyff is the reason why one team beat another team this weekend in the Premier League. But there is sadly only one place we can start. The Women's World Cup final in which Spain beat England 1-0. It was a fantastic game of football, tactically superb and really interesting stuff from Spain and England. Actually, the approach of both teams throughout the tournament has been fascinating to watch with England having to deal with a lot of tactical changes and even in this game, Serena Wegman trying to make changes. But Spain did a and they did a bit of a job on England. The big thing was working down the sides and actually focusing on those wide areas. If you have a look at Spain here, sorry, I've been having a look uh, in the meantime, especially down this left-hand side, and actually the goal comes from it, we'll show you in a second. Olga Carmona was fantastic, bombing up, but it was those wide areas in particular, and, you know, Caldente as well, they worked together down that left-hand side to really frustrate Lucy Bronze, who was always going to be a key player in terms of getting forward. She didn't make a single key pass in this game, and we know the quality that she has. And also a, a real big part of the game, as I said, both sides of the pitch, actually, as well. And Bon Matty was absolutely fantastic in this game as well. Hermoso, of course, missed a penalty, but was that backboard throughout. But the focus was always down both sides of the pitch. But in particular, when it came to this right-hand side, Side, which I think they must have focused on in terms of stopping Lucy Bronze. They were looking to double up on her, not give her the opportunities that she wanted, Lucy Bronze. And also were looking to exploit her when she went forward. And you can see that from the goal. So you can see in the screenshot, you know, with England playing that back three, Jess Carter actually has to come out and engage with Caldente here, who we've just spoken about. If you think of that back three for England, it's Jess Carter, it's Millie Bright and it's uh, Greenwood. They're in okay position and you think you should be all right, but you're only kind of all right if Lucy Bronze is in her position as that right wing back. And she wasn't, um, you know, you can see Rachel Daly on her way back. So she's there and she's covering. But the problem is because Lucy Bronze was able to bomb forward, they saw the opportunity and Olga Carmona, she was the one. She was the one that made used that energy to get up the pitch and to start those half spaces, but allow that, you know, overlap there which led to the goal. What a finish it was as well. An absolutely fantastic goal that was worthy of winning any game. But utilising that space that Lucy Bronze had left behind was definitely a weakness that they exploited. That's not on Lucy Bronze, but it's just what happened, basically. But in games of high quality like this, those are the moments, and it is a, a bit of a chess match. I thought tactically England have been one of the best in the tournament with Serena Wiegmann showing she's not scared to make big, bold, tactical decisions. And I heard it through the grapevine that some people even want her to replace Southgate one day. And who can blame them with some of the genius decisions that she's made for England? For example, playing Rachel Daly as a left wing back. Of course, she's been a striker or well, solo striker for Aston Villa this season and has been superb in that role. But she moved there and did brilliantly well, nearly created a goal for Hemp at one point, of course, hit the bar. Another decision that Vigman made that I thought was interesting was her decision of playing with without wingers and therefore playing Lauren James as a 10. James plays for her club, Chelsea, on the right wing, but thrived in that 10 position during this tournament. Of course, there was that 6-1 victory against China. She was directly involved in five of those goals. Of course, I think she needs to learn from that misdemeanor that meant that she missed a couple of games. And one thing, one critique I've got to say when it comes to England is that there felt like a bit of a lack of composure. I thought they had enough quality to, to deal with the time that was left and to actually create something instead of kind of putting Millie Bright up front maybe a little bit too early and that leads to you just sort of pumping the ball long. Yes, they got one or two chances, but if you look at that momentum bar, yes, they were pushing for it, but I think they had the quality on the pitch and especially with Russo coming off during the game, it felt like to me that they needed to be patient, be composed and understand that that game was going to have 10 minutes added time and wait for the moment. I think if they'd done that a little bit better and it's so hard to do when it comes to a World Cup final, then they would have been in a much better place. But only two players from that starting lineup were over 30. So this is a young team and that English dominance or certainly the finals, the semi-finals, it's going to be happening for the foreseeable future. And so they can be very proud of what they've done. And I think we can be really excited about England's women for well, a long, long time to come.
Fingers crossed. We move to the Premier League and Tottenham won, of course, against Man United. 2-0 victory, 1.37 to 2.07 XG, which I think is really interesting here. And as I said at the start of the video, Johan Cruyff was the reason that Tottenham won this match. And Gary Neville needs to take note, OK? Now, we're going to begin with Man United. Now, on the face of it, you may think that Manchester United were hard done by when looking at the XG, for example. But the patterns of play massively let them down against Tottenham. And in my opinion, that was the difference between the sides. When Man United got into Spurs' half and final third, they looked OK in chance creation. They were able to lean on Bruno Fernandes' creativity. He made four key passes in the game, as well as creating two big chances and missing an absolute city. Thanks a lot because he's in my FPL team. But the problem for Man United was trying to build up from the back. And this is where Johan Cruyff comes into it. He famously said that build-up play shouldn't be centred around wide backs. Now, what this means is that you don't want to be playing it to your fullbacks in the first phase of play if they're in wide positions. This is because it makes it very hard to then play the ball back into central areas unless you have a ludicrously technical set of fullbacks. These next two images show exactly why this is a problem for Man United. So these two screenshots will reveal a lot to some, but Man United fans have probably been tearing their hair out on this one for quite some time. So let's start off with Spurs. And in terms of their press, this is what we're looking at. That is the press of Tottenham. It's narrow, and of course, it's a high press as well. That's the way Postacoglu wants to play, with Richarlison's going to be doing a hell of a lot of work when it comes to this. Now, in terms of what Cruyff says, Cruyff says that ideally you want to play the ball to the man in the middle because he has an option. He has an option. I mean, he has an option, right? Or I guess he can go back as well. The problem, especially with a narrow press that Tottenham are playing here, and if we move it along, you'll see this, is that if you move, if you play the ball out wide, which is what Anana does, you simply can't play the ball back into a central area. And that means that you have to play it down the line, which makes it easier for the team that's pressing. So Anana has played that pass out to wan -Bissaka, And because of that block that we're talking about from Tottenham being narrow and then just being concerned with not allowing the ball to go back into that central area, he has absolutely no option, wan apart from playing the ball up the line, which is what he does. He plays the ball about here to Rashford, a little bit higher up. Rashford tries to chest it down, but the pressure's on them and Tottenham win the ball back. So not only are we going to highlight the issue, we're going to provide the solution for you. So Eric, mate, you know, get your notepad out, or it's at least it's just my view on it. Let me know in the comments below if you disagree with this. So this is that screenshot, that first screenshot. So as you can see, when the ball gets to Anana, you can see that wan is racing back to be that option out wide. But what I think that they need to do is they need to trust in this man. They need to trust in Anana. They need to create a box, that Deserby box, or a Pentagon, if you will. Stay with me. At the moment, this is kind of what's happening when the team is being pressed against, right? But something needs to change here. I think Anana, you need to utilize his quality on the ball. And actually, if we go back to that screenshot for a second, if he puts his foot on the ball for a second, or if he's willing to trust someone like Varane, as we spoke about, then you're in a much better position because he has got options to play. I think the problem at the moment is because they're a little bit stretched, that is a dangerous pass. That is a dangerous pass. I mean, that is a safe pass, but it's kind of into trouble, which is the whole point, you know, that we're saying don't do that don't play that wide pass but if we go and have a look at how they could work a box or a, as I say a bit of a pentagon if they suck teams in deep and players like Varane Anana's brave enough to hold on to the ball and this could be a bit scary at times okay you're gonna have Richarlison running at him but that takes someone someone out of it and allows you to sort of play out from the back and importantly when we're talking about a bit of a box there's one person that's going to be absolutely crucial here Mason Mount Mason Mount has to be the guy, in my opinion. Look, we've got Fernandez here as well. He could be the other guy that does that. I just, I personally think Mason Mount takes care of the ball just that little bit better, if I'm honest. But creating that pentagon and sucking in the opposition could help with what Ten Hag really wants to do, which is to be great in transition. But if wan stays here, Shaw stays here, they've got to be brave with this. But importantly, Varane drops in. Martinez drops in, maybe comes in wide as well, especially against teams that are all going to press against you. You're going to need to make that box or that pentagon, as we've spoken about. And I do think Mason Mount is the guy. And if you're able to do that, you then give yourself so many more options here for Anana. He can play that pass. Hang on. He can play that pass here. He can play that pass to Martinez. He can play that pass to Mount. He can play that pass to Casemiro. And when it comes to 
pressing them. Richarlison's obviously going to go to the ball and try and stop those passing lanes. But even in terms of options to get yourself around it, you've then got a much quicker pass out wide and up the pitch, and then you can play yourself back into into those central areas and then hurt the opposition with those passes in behind. This has to be what Eric Ten Hag is going to move towards if he doesn't sign another player. But I think deep down, he wants Mason Mount to be that player and he wants Fernandez to be that little bit higher up. Look, he's going to get pressed by, by Basuma, but to be honest, when it comes to that, you know, that uh, press from the opposition, you're actually, they're working as a four here. So that Basuma player and maybe Pepe Sar will, you know, or that other midfielder will go with Mason Mount and make an option. But again, the options are so varied with that box, you can play out of it pretty quickly. And that's what Man United have to do to get better. Because, you know, if you get to a, a world where you've got all this space to play with and to allow Rashford to get into four against four, three against three. Man United against start hurting teams. Okay, now for Spurs. What a performance. And Postacoglu, I will always love you when you do things like what you have done to Basuma over the summer. Eves Basuma is just a gem to watch in this system. And the stats back it up. As that single pivot, his contribution in all thirds was absolutely invaluable in this game. He received the ball a total of 46 times. Only Van der Ven and Christian Romero received the ball more than Basuma. And as a progressor, he ticked all the boxes too. Three progressive carries, but also three progressive passes in the match just shows that he drives the ball forward for Spurs in different ways, which makes it hard to create a specific plan on how to stop him. But the Spurs midfield is so much more than just Basuma, and we need to highlight it here on the fallout. Pape Sar's shot map is just the visualization of one of the best principles of Angeball. This is a striker's shot map that you're seeing here, but Sar is obviously a midfielder. The volume of shots and the frequency in which he popped up in the box meant that he was eventually always going to have the opportunity to score. Yes, they got a little bit of luck with it, but come on. That's an Ange ball goal. Lastly, the jewel in the crown, James Madison. He's going to put up some ridiculous numbers this season, especially in this system. He made 10, <laughs> he made 10 progressive passes during the match, as well as two key passes and three passes into the box. Just by sheer volume of chances created, I think that he could get 10 assists by Christmas at this rate. Liverpool got a 3-0 victory at Anfield against Bournemouth, who were pretty impressive, I've got to be honest. And what does this victory tell us about Liverpool? Well, I thought this game showed us a lot lot about Liverpool's problems but also strengths and why they could face some problems but also simultaneously have some superb moments this year and that they are, there are a few players that we've got to talk about, I think, when it comes to Liverpool, especially this performance. Bournemouth did really well defensively against Liverpool, sort of baiting them into a central press. They were allowing the centre-backs to have the ball as much as they wanted, really. But they were sort of goading them into playing the ball into central areas. Trent here. And in particular, one man, Philip Billing. Philip Billing was playing in that double pivot, but often was able to sort of step into that press and get at the opposition. And actually, from this screenshot, they win the ball and Bournemouth score a goal. Bournemouth got real quality this season, and I think they're going to have a lot of fun. But I do think that one thing won the match for Liverpool. The quality of some of their individuals was just, it was a bit of a joke. And it shone through. Firstly, Diaz's goal where he flicks it up and set up a volley for himself. It was just unbelievable. It really reignited the Liverpool attack. The other player I want to talk about is Zavoslai. I think he's really, really interesting for this Liverpool side. And in particular, on the right-hand side of the pitch, he's going to be absolutely crucial. Now, this is in the lead-up to the Diaz goal, which we've spoken about, is gorgeous, right? What's really important, and he did this throughout the game, and these three players are going to be so important this season. Salah, Sabozlai, and Trent. Those three are just going to be so, so important. What's great here is with Trent and with Sabozlai, you've got two players who can switch the ball and switch the ball incredibly quickly. So that's one asset that you've got. You can play those long passes which is going to concern the opposition. It's going to allow you to use the width of the pitch. And within two passes, they start wide, stay out of the way, because it allows for this area of the pitch to be to be theirs, to get the ball in the half spaces, which then can drag other players in and allow maybe Trent to have the ball higher up the pitch. And in a couple of ways, he did it. So again, if we move forward, within two passes, he starts wide, then drops into that area there. There, right? And he gets the ball. And what happens is, Little pass to Trent. 
Trent is then able to cut through. And what's really interesting here is that Trent, who we thought was going to be the guy who was going to be here all the time, isn't. And that's what's great about both these players. They're both technically very interesting. And having Trent higher up the pitch is not the end of the world. The other thing that I wanted to show you, again, in terms of having Trent in a higher position, is him being able to get the ball in this area here. Because if he is able to get on the ball, you know, have that picture behind him, have that awareness to get on it turn, he then is able to play a long ball. I think he completed four long balls in this game, be it switches or with this clip, which is a, a lovely little pass to Trent. So again, you're getting the best out of your best players, be it Trent, be it Sabozlai in those half spaces, but of course Salah as well. I think this is something that Sabozlai is going to do all season long because by staying wide, Trent can come in and do that if he wants to. But also, importantly, as we've just spoken about, suppose like dropping in and playing that pass, it means that Trent can go beyond and Salah can join in as a striker. The rotation between these three could be really interesting. Trent received five progressive passes in this game. And look, we love Alexander-Arnold in this area of the pitch, but we also love him in this area of the pitch as well because he's got that quality to put those great crosses in. Diaz can play higher at the pitch if that focus is down that right-hand side. Also kind of works with Robertson being able to get higher up the pitch as well. Really interesting time for Liverpool tactically as they kind of find their feet, but it's not the end of the world to have Trent Alexander out wide despite all this conversation throughout the season in terms of him being a more central figure. Brentford are scary this year and I don't like it and we need to talk about them sadly because their form that they're displaying early on looks like they're, they're a problem for everybody in the Premier League this year. Last week they of course went with a 5-3-2 against Tottenham but against Fulham they went 4 Three, three. This is something that I know Brentford fans have been screaming for and we are seeing in reality now against the lesser side. The front three, in my opinion, is the biggest talking point for Brentford. The cohesiveness, or I can't, that's easy for me to say, the cohesiveness of the front line and how they all have sort of different aspects at play, but they also kind of like to swap about a little bit as well. It's just really sort of progressive. It's direct. It's fun. Uh, it's a real unit in terms of that front three. And actually, in particular as well, actually, in terms of it being a four, you've still got Rico Henry and Hickey bombing down those sides as well. The stats are demonstrative of this as well. Johan Visser took seven shots in the game, and that shows how well Brentford are coping without Ivan Tony and without a natural striker for that matter. And he was able to do this because of the tactical approach of Brentford. There's a lovely mix in this team. You've got, you know, hard workers in that midfield in terms of Norgard and Jensen and Janel and, you know, a bit of quality in there, of course, as well. But then pace, raw, raw pace when it comes to these guys. Hickey, as we've spoken about, Wissa and Buemo. Sade are all able to run and stretch teams massively. It's simple, it's direct, it's fun, and it allows chance creation to be quite simple for them because they've got the beating of their opposition a lot of the time. You can see from this break here that desire to get the ball in behind the opposition is always there for them. And again, you can see it from the body language of the players there themselves. And Buemo, ready to go like he always has been. Jan Wisser, ready to go as well. And Sade, I think, looking to make that run as well when the time comes. He's trying to stay on the blind side for now, but you're looking to get in behind. And of course, the pass is exactly that as well. Looking to play that pass in behind. Pace. Direct attacks, simple passes, and an XG of over three. Fully deserved from Brentford. And But... They also, I think the other thing, that by attacking in this method and looking for cutbacks, uh, what they're also doing is they're creating high-value chances. I think this can be seen through their expected assists of 2.32, which is also very high and shows how the chances created were high-value, which is very, very Brentford, isn't it? In fact, actually, Brentford created five big chances in this one. Do Fulham need to be worried? Well, after beating Everson, it looked for a second that they were still going to be a good side this year, but there are two things that I think Fulham fans need to be wary of. The first is the fact that they have now conceded a total of 6.3 expected goals over the first two matches of the Premier League season. This is the most of any Premier League side. The second most is Wolves, who have conceded 4.4. So that tells you that Fulham's defence might be a little bit ropey, certainly early on at least. The second worry I have is that their XG created against Brentford was poor. You know, without Mitrovic, they look somewhat a little bit lost in terms of that player that can be that hold-up player. And Fulham only had a total of two shots on target and the lack of Mitrovic looked like it affected Andres Pereira, who only made one key pass and one pass into the penalty area in this one. Early days, but they need to make the right replacement after losing someone who has provided so many goals for this football club over the last couple of seasons. Just going to pause for a second, a couple of super, super important 
things on the channel. We have another brand new show starting on the JLA channel. Really excited to, to get it out there. We've been working on it for a while. We've got some amazing experts from the other big four leagues. La Liga, Serie A, the Bundesliga and League Earn. And we're going to have a Euro catch up show. So that's not catch up, that's catch up. So if you are new to the channel, you've enjoyed this video and enjoyed what we're doing here. We're trying to level up. We're trying to give you some more stuff. And if you don't have all that time to watch all of European football, then this is going to be the show for you. It's going to allow you to catch up and get value from people who are experts in those leagues. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and also Chelsea are it's all a bit too crazy. So for Chelsea, we're going to do a focus on them and how the new signings are going to change. And that's also going to be out this week, as is the narrative week two of the narrative, which is a brand new show that has you guys starring in it every single week. So, so many reasons to subscribe to the channel and importantly, hit that notification bell as well. Wolves 1, Brighton, Hove Albion 4. Roberto De Zerbi alluded to the fact that Brighton were going to try something different this season and we may have already seen it with what they did against Wolves. It was a fantastic performance from Brighton from an attacking perspective and they have now had a total of 43 shots from their opening two matches despite selling their best two centre midfielders. It's, it's simply crazy. It's... It's very rock and roll, but I love rock and roll. And that's what we're going to speak about in terms of how Brighton have made tweaks to their game this season. And I want to talk about Julio Enciso. Now, Julio Enciso played in the team, of course, in this game and was involved in all four goals. Now, we know how important the wide players are in a De Zerbi system. That dates back to his time at Sassuolo. Now, the fear, I think, for Brighton and De Zerbi this season would be that teams might sort of highlight their wingers and, and know that they need to stop those guys. And if you stop those guys, then you'll stop them. So that tweak in the system that was made, I think we saw it in this one. And it's the role of that man in CISO because the movement that he displayed was somewhat sacrificial at times. Now, he got himself two assists as well, but those assists came from wide areas of the pitch. But his movement for Matoma's goal is crucial. He makes this move here. I'll show you the screenshot in a second. He makes a crucial bit of movement to allow Welbeck to, to, to get himself a goal as well. And then he gets an assist for March. But that assist comes from incredible movement from him. So let's show you those screenshots. Now, the goal from Matoma is absolutely unbelievable, right? He gets the ball here. He drives. But why is there such a big area of space here especially when you've got a guy who's supposedly playing in the number 10 role which would obviously be right here well it's because he's a smart bloke and he offers that movement and so if you go back a little bit and you watch the goal back you will see him in exactly that area but he doesn't stay there he makes that run he understands the space and this is him right here he makes that little move and takes away players and it leaves that massive space there for Matoma to, to go into. Now, we know what Matoma is going to do, but if he hasn't got the space to do it, then he's not going to do it. And that's why this is fantastic stuff from Enciso. Enciso's fabulous movement is the same catalyst for the second goal. Gilmore gets the ball and plays the ball out to Sully March. Welbeck sort of comes in to help out. And Enciso, importantly, instead of sort of looking to spin and sort of, you know, get a goal himself, just drags a defender out and leaves this absolutely enormous disappointing hole if you're a Wolves fan for Welbeck to go and get the second goal for the team. So again, his movement's crucial there. This leads to a chance and then at the end of it all, a stupid Yan pops the ball in the back of the net. And the fourth goal, which is an assist from NC, so again, is it's down to his wonderful movement. And look, it's De Zerbi that's putting it into them to make those decisions, but it's just so smart. Now, in the previous one, Welbeck didn't get the ball. The ball went wide and NCSO took a player out that way. On this occasion, they completely sort of discombobulate the opposition because on this occasion, Welbeck does receive the ball and then he turns and he drives. Now, Enciso could make a really simple spin run here and look to sort of get a through ball from Welbeck or just take a defender away that way. He doesn't do that. They're much. It's so much more nuanced than that and it's really, really smart stuff. Instead, Sully March knows that once Welbeck's got the ball and he's driving, those two should switch. And Enciso instead makes his way out here. Sully March makes his way here, does the opposite run. And it just completely confuses the Wolves' defence. At the right 
time. Welbeck plays a great pass. And then you've got fantastic vision from Enciso to play the perfect pass for March, who gets his goal. Those goals just don't happen if he's not on the pitch. You know, the intelligence and appreciation of where to move to make space for his teammates. <sighs> I just massively shone in this one. Just to add, his stats from the game are also quality. Five progressive carries, two key passes, and six successful take-ons. This guy is a magician. Look, Wolves, I thought, got done by the better team on the day. It's hard to be hyperbolic about a team when they get battered by Brighton because, as I said last season, anyone can get battered by Brighton. But there are some positives for Wolves. They created 2.14 XG, had 16 shots, which was actually the same as Brighton, and had good periods of pressure, as we can see from the momentum bar. But one problem I can see already is the quality from the bench. Against Brighton and Man United, Wolves have been better in the second half. And if they had some quality from the bench to add to this, I think they could have packed a bit more of a punch in the latter stages of a match. Huang came off from the bench and scored in this match, but past him, I can't see any match winners at all. Man City won Newcastle, nil, really tight game, but we did learn some important things about both these teams and the outcome of these things are fascinating for what it means going forward, starting off with Newcastle. And despite losing, I think there's some big positives for Newcastle here. Last season, Man City only lost one game all season long at home and only conceded 17 goals and more importantly scored 60 in their 19 matches. So for Newcastle to not only keep the scoreline tight but also keep the XG to a minimum, I think it showed how they are a very tough team to play against and have all the fight in the world. I thought the two centre-backs in particular really battled valiantly in what was a really tough game for them. For Man City, I think we're starting to see the team take a new direction in terms of who the stars are and important players will be for them this season. Starting off with Kovacic, I think he adds a lot in the centre for Man City for a couple of different reasons. I thought that the way that he carried the ball and the way that he was in possession was a good insight into the different threat that this Man City will have this season. This screenshot says a lot about what Kovacic brings. Yes, we spoke about it last week in terms of the tempo of him as a player. That's brilliant. But he also takes players out. I think it's something that we're going to do on the channel. Talk about sort of progressing the ball and taking players out of the game. The game is so structured now that you have to have that ability and Kovacic has that ability and you can see that here because in terms of, you know, engaging someone like Bruno Gomez, I think he gives a foul away on this one. But the point is, is that, you know, he has to engage and, and look, either he takes him out or Kovacic skips past him or, you know, he knows and he's got the quality to play that little pass into Foden. You can see Haaland even looking to sort of get him to play the ball to Foden because he has that ability. And importantly, Foden consistently playing in between the lines. I thought he was fantastic, but Kovacic is able to draw players in that then just creates so much space for him. The second point on Kovacic is that it allows Rodri not a free role, but a freer role. And you saw that in terms of him in possession, but also out of possession as well. He can sort of go to the opposition and, and almost kind of um, orchestrate the press a lot of the time, knowing that Kovacic will be in behind. But also with the ball as well, because Rodri, I think last season, averaged 8.2 um, passes into the final third during a game. This season, he's averaging 12 per 90 in the first two games. He had 10 in this one. Kovacic only made five. So his role is adapting and his influence is getting stronger by having Kovacic alongside him. The final person I want to talk about when it comes to Man City is Phil Foden. We've been waiting for him to play in this role. We've been wondering what his role would be when it came to Pep Guardiola's team. And... It is that 10 role. It looks like this is going to be the future for him. And I, for one, am all for it because I thought it was really interesting and it offers so much to this Man City team. First of all, the ability almost to have three against four. Now, that doesn't sound like an advantage, but when you've got the quality of Foden and Alvarez and, and the, the positions that they can pick up, that's just such a, an asset. And that's something that Edison has been doing more and more. Happy to play that long ball. You know, Guardiola, we thought, you know, they're always going to dominate possession, but they're not bothered when it comes to that. And actually, I think the general setup you would have thought when it comes to this game is you think it's going to be a 4-2-4, four, four, something like that. And that's something that we've spoken about on the channel and Alvarez and his role. But Foden played very, very centrally here and Alvarez kind of did as well. And it allowed those three players to take the opposition out of the game, make it very difficult for them. Walker played a lot higher. That was really important. But in particular, Foden was given a real free reign to sort of get around the pitch. But in particular, make sure that he stayed in these half spaces. By having that central starting position, it allowed him to move into those half spaces instead of being out wide and kind of easier to, to mark. And you see that in the first goal. Because... 
here, you can see him. There, as Carragher would say. Right in the middle of the pitch. Now, if he starts here, then it's easier to defend and you're stopping that pass. But what's really smart is that this guy is so intelligent, but by starting in and going out... He utilises that sort of blind spot of Joe Linton. Kovacic has got the quality to find him, and he does. But importantly, none of that happens if you don't have the width of Carl Walker here. He's a bit of a decoy, and Dan Byrne is obviously concerned about him because, you know, he's got the quality to, to make that run. But this whole space that's completely alleviated, that's real genius from Foden to understand where the space is, but also importantly from Guardiola, to have these three players in one central zone to almost suck in the opposition to then allow for those spaces, those half spaces that really Guardiola wants his, uh, his team to be getting into. And the goal comes from that. And actually on the tactics board, we can probably show you how it played out and, and how crucial that movement and that starting point is as well. Because what's genius here is that if Foden starts here, the back line of Newcastle, it stays in pretty good nick, right? They don't have to move laterally. You don't have to move on to him because Dan Burns probably here just marking him already. But what's great about Foden starting out here is that by him then making that dying run and getting that pass, right, what it does is it's on that blind, blind side. Again, Carl Walker's crucial here because Dan Byrne has to stay honest and stay with him. It doesn't focus with him. But it drags along Shah. And by dragging along Shah, sorry if we bring Haaland in here, what that does is allows Foden with the quality that he's got, the picture that he's already seen, it allows him to play that little pass to Alvarez. And so... Without that starting point, there isn't that movement which doesn't drag the Newcastle defender, which doesn't give Alvarez that moment to to finish unbelievably. Shall we do it? Whee! Bosh. Foden's stats also show how Pep is allowing him to become the primary creator in this side. Foden made seven key passes against Newcastle. The only other player to make multiple key passes was Alvarez with two.